Now we start electrodynamics. Of course, electrical phenomena have been known in, in European culture already by, by Greeks. I don't know how was it on other continents. No. So just before Maxwell, we knew that electricity acts somehow on electric charges and this action was characterized by the value of the electric field. That usually it is there is an arrow above it to, 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 to say that it is a vector but <laughs> I have a tendency to omit them, those arrows, but in any case. So what is electric field? So this is a potential force which acts on a unit uh, electric charge. If I put an electric charge Q, then this is a force, electric force, which, which acts on that. And up to uh, Maxwell, people were thinking about physics as interaction, in terms of interaction between uh, bodies. But Maxwell started this field theoretical way of thinking that the, if, if two charges uh, attract each other or, or, or repulse, then they do it with intermediation of a field, that one of these fields produces uh, an electric field, and now if we put the, the other one in this field, then there is a, a, a force which acts on them. On the other hand, this also produces its own field, and the first one feels not just this charge, but it feels the, the field. <coughs> Okay, so electric field. We were, so people started to think that there are not only that uh, bodies like a table or chair, chairs, but that uh, when we are thinking that it is empty, it is not empty because there is some property of space time which somehow changes there. I have a tendency, yeah, of course, now very often we say that there are fields and particles, they, they uh, interact somehow. I have a tendency to think that there are only fields, that particles are, are also built out of fields. This was a, an idea of, uh, of Einstein, he had a, to a lot of uh, papers when he tried to to convince people that this is the correct way of thinking about physics, but nowadays his program has not yet been fulfilled. In any case, electric field. On the other hand, electricity uh, manifests himself or her, herself or what? <laughs> himself. <laughs> His, yeah. I'm not sufficiently... Yeah. Uh, in another formula, namely the polarization. If there is an electric 
uh, field around, then if we put some material, it get, gets polarized. And this polarization is uh, measured by another field, which we often call electric induction field. But very, of, uh, very often, people have discovered that they are proportional, that there is some coefficient between them, which in a vacuum it is called ips nowadays epsilon zero. I hate this terminology, but at the moment let me follow it because I want to somehow show you how Maxwell, how the Maxwell theory was conceived. Therefore, at that time, there were two different manifestations of electricity, namely electric, oh, sorry, excuse me, yeah. some the electric field, I will skip this arrow, but we remember that these are vector fields, yeah? So at each point, there is something like a small arrow which shows how big is the, of course, this is only a visualization which <laughs> does not correspond. We um, have to choose some how big is this arrow for unit electricity and so on and so on. But roughly speaking, we may imagine that there are so arrows and people immediately started to say that it is a field, vector field, because as on the field there are uh, plants which grow, here there are vectors which grow on the field. So whenever we have a mapping from some portion of a space to vectors, which means to, that to every vector there is a, uh, sorry, to every point there is a vector which is assigned, then we say it is a vector field. For computational reasons, we may characterize the field by its three components. We can choose some Cartesian coordinates. Therefore, to nicely describe a vector field, we need to have three functions. How the first component of this field depends upon x, y, z, how the second component and the third. Yeah. So for computational reasons, vector field is nothing but three uh, uh, functions, scalar functions. But of course it is much more because it behaves under the change of co coordinates and the change of of uh, um, of the reference frame and so on and so on. It is a different subject, and we will study it. But at the first glance, you may say that ve vector fields is nothing but three functions. This is very naive, but sometimes. It, it pays to, to use it. Yeah, okay. Moreover, there are also magnetic uh, phenomena. And again, there is a magnetic field which is called H, and we measure it in such a way that we put a compass, a small magnet, and then it follows the velocity, or uh, not velocity, the um, direction of the field, and also the, the strength of the field corresponds to how fast it will come to that. So, it, for example, if we have a a, a, a wire with electric current, then I will soon come to that. There is a magnetic field which is, uh, which is produced around this 
electric current. So there is this. However, magnetic phenomena manifest themselves also in another way, namely, again, polarization. If I put the uh, material, magnetic, uh, ferromagnetic material, then it will be magnetized. So again, a polarization, and this polarization is can be measured by, again, a field which is called magnetic induction. And again, people were able to, to show that these fields are proportional. Although they, are measured, they have been measured in completely different uh, units because these are different phenomena completely. So, so the first uh, observation was that again these two fields are proportional. However, this proportionality I have written zero, which nowadays uh, correspond to the fact that it is in, in, in vacuum or in the air which doesn't differ too much from, from the vacuum but in ele the electric nowadays people have produced a lot of very strange materials where this M, M can be even negative you, you, you probably have read that there are um, aircrafts or uh, airplanes which are non-visible by, by the radar because they have negative mu or something like that. This, is the, uh, this technology is very much advanced. In any case, in times of Maxwell, there was E0 and mu0, however, they uh, knew already the electric materials where those E was slightly different and uh, some, some materials where mu0 was different from mu0. In any case, in, in vacuum, people have calculated this coefficients with a pretty good accuracy. It, it was now. And there, uh, the following equations have been, or law of electromagnetism, have been known. First of all, it was known that the total flux of electric um, induction around a, uh, through the boundary of some, some region is equal to the uh, total electric charge which is con contained there. But of course, if we translate it into very small uh, regions, then we will obtain the uh, differential form of, of this equation, which is the divergence of D is equal rho, where rho it is a uh, um, charge density. Yeah, of course, you know that this corresponds after integration. If we integrate, if we take some volume O and we integrate this, this uh, law, then what we get, it is uh, divergence of D equal 
uh, yeah, over O, over O, rho, and this is nothing but the total charge, yeah, because if we, on the other hand, due to this Gauss law, it may be translated into a, a boundary integral, yeah, so this is d and integrated over the sigma. So people knew that the total flux of the induction through the boundary of the volume is equal to the total charge contained in the volume. And this was only due to Maxwell that he passed to the limit, took <laughs> uh, uh, this volume O smaller and smaller and smaller, so the infinitesimal version of this equation is precisely this equation. So this was already known. Also, people knew that there are no magnetic charges. Whenever we have a magnet, then of course we see that this uh, is the North Pole and it somehow acts this way. This is a South Pole, but we are never able to divide them. If we take a half of, of a magnet, again there will be two magnets and four poles. <laughs> Yeah, which simply means that there are no magnetic charges, which means that the same Gauss law for the magnetic uh, induction is zero. Excuse me, I, I am a very old man and I forgot the name of the uh, extremely uh, important physicist, British physicist, who invented the way to visualize this field by these lines. His portrait is here nearby. For, um, what? Faraday. Okay. Excuse me. Faraday. Okay. Faraday invented a very intelligent way to visualize those fields. Namely, the, uh, when you have the, the field, then there are also the, um, the integral lines. So he proposed to replace, because to uh, visualize it with many, many small arrows, it is not very practical. So he invented the way that forget about our arrows. Of course, arrows are there. But in order to visualize, just use those uh, lines. Huh. But there is one problem, because line shows the uh, direction, but does not show how strong is. With a, so he invented that the density of line will be proportional to the strength. If the strength is big, then the lines will be very uh, dense. If instead, yeah, one line represents one unit of D per one unit of, of the surface. So it was very, very intelligent. It's from the scientific point of view, it is nothing, just a way to visualize. But thinking in terms of those slides, uh, lines was very helped people to to understand the, the structure of, of this electromagnetic field. So in terms of those lines, we may, may say that magnetic lines never have no end. 
electric lights and on uh, charges, whereas magnetic lights must always be closed. Yeah, this is. It is not very deep what I have told you, but this visualization really helped people in the 19th century to understand the structure of, yeah, and this is due to Faraday. Okay. Moreover, so I, I leave it. Moreover, people knew that whenever I have a, a an electric current, call it J, it is again a vector, but I will skip vectors because I don't like them. Then immediately it produces a circular magnetic line about the magnetic field around it. For the first time I have seen this in elementary school, I believe in when I was 11. Our teacher have shown us this, in, and so this was very important experience for me that you switch on the, the J and the magnetic arrow immediately goes like that. You switch off and it returns to its place. Beautiful. And again, we, uh, people have measured it that uh, very close it is stronger than it is bigger and so on. And finally, they came to the conclusion that rotation, which curl in Polish language curl is denoted by rotation rod. Yeah, okay, but it is just curl. That the curl of H is proportional to J. Again, there have been first Biot Savart law, which is um, integral. But it is, uh, Maxwell came to conclusion in that it is much more handy to consider those uh, loads in uh, differential form. So, and finally, Faraday himself discovered this uh, magnetic induction law. Yeah? So the curl of E is equal to B dot. Yeah? That if we move a uh, magnet within a, a conductor, a conducting, then it uh, produces the electric field and this electric field acts on electrons, free electrons, uh, which provokes the electric current. Of course, at the beginning, this law was written in, in uh, integral form as a relation between the change of the flux and the electric current which is provoked, but it is much better to pass to the differential form. So Maxwell began his story with this equation. So first of all, he noticed, ah, by the way, this, so this is Faraday law, these two are called Gauss laws. Gauss. This law is called uh, Ampere. Ampere was a French physicist at the beginning of 
19th century, he did so with his ampere. And this law is, of course, Faraday. Yeah, this is fundamental because this enables us to produce electricity in, in electric station. So, first observation by Maxwell, he was not first to write down in this way, but mostly in, ex in uh, textbooks, this law was not written this way, but was written in, uh, uh, in integral form. And therefore, it was difficult really to understand the meaning. Maxwell has written that, and he told, no, it is impossible. It cannot be true. Why cannot it be true? Because if I apply divergence to both sides, then I obtain divergence of curl of H, but di divergence of curl is zero. As we will see, I don't know how much did you study this, but probably you know it. But I am going, I am going to enter a little bit into this vector calculus or something like that. But probably you know, you know it, yeah? Divergence of curl is zero, which simply means that if this is true, that the divergence of J is equal to, to zero. But this cannot be true. Why? Because this phenomena we have already discussed when I was deriving for you sound equation. And I have written the uh, continuity equation. Continuity equation means that no, ma at that time it, this was continuity, matter continuity, continuity for the density of the air. But also, in case of electricity, this is continuity equation which tells that no charge is created. Of course, creation and annihilation of, of pairs may occur, and it is an important phenomenon. But there is never, but never a, a charge is created. Only God has law is allowed to create electric charge. We are not. We never create charge. We only somehow create pairs. And this law tells you that if I inte integrate, yeah, because if I integrate this, I have already discussed that, but I will slowly repeat. If I integrate over a volume O, then of rho dot, but so this is what? This is total electric charge dot. Yeah? On the other hand, this is a divergence of u, so this is a, of the divergence of j, which again is, uh, sorry, this is of uh, uh, integral over o, so we translate it into a, an integrate over the, vo, uh, the surface, j n d sigma. So if this is fulfilled, it, it, this is equivalent to the uh, uh, integral version, which tells you 
that the change of the total charge within the volume O is due only to the uh, transfer of the electric current across the surface. If this is zero, then it means that everything has been frozen. No charge can move. Because if charge moves, and for instance, if charge leaves from uh, O and goes outside, then there must be some current across uh, the surface. So if somebody claims that in nature divergence of J is zero, then he claims that the charges do not move. They are frozen, which obviously is not true. So Maxwell uh, so told us, no, it cannot be true. There is something else here, very small, which probably we, we do not observe, or maybe we do not observe because what we do are only um, static uh, um, experiments, but it must be something else. And after some time, he invented this, that there must be additional term of this equation, which had never been observed before him. So it was just him, his science fiction idea that there must be, so why? Why precisely that? Because now if we take again a curl, then we will get divided on the left hand side we get zero, as before, yeah? Therefore, we obtain zero. And here, we get divergence of V plus divergence of D dot. But divergence of D dot, so is divergence of D dot. And divergence of D, the humanity knew already that the divergence of the field D is equal to rho, therefore it is rho, huh? uh, sorry, what is B? J, sorry. And this way, he improved this crazy assumption that no electric charge is allowed to move. No, no, it is allowed. But this is conservation of the current. So he, so you see, I, I told this term science fiction because it has never been observed before. But it was not so stupid because he wanted just to recover conservation of, of electric charge. So this was his starting point, and he, nowadays these equations are called Maxwell equations. And later on we will rewrite this, uh, sorry, there is an error, here must be minus, excuse me. If uh, in vacuum, these two, when j is equal to zero, these two equations are similar, but one of them has different sign. And I remember that this is without sign, so this must have uh, minus sign. By the way, this additional term, uh, uh, Maxwell called um, prompt przesunięcia. 
I forgot the displacement. Repla displacement. displacement current. Yeah, displacement current. Excuse me. And now, of course, uh, the next time we will rewrite this equation in terms because they are incompatible with general relativity in a sense, so we will rewrite them in, in yet another form, but nowadays what the I, uh, Maxwell did, so in, in vacuum, we have both divergences of B equal divergence of D equal zero, and now curl of H equal D dot, curl of E equal minus B dot. Okay? And now let us make the following exercise. Calculate, let us calculate second time derivative of D. So it is curl of H dot, yeah? So maybe I will, uh, no, okay. Which is equal curl, which is equal D over DT, curl, and the relation between between H and B. So let us instead of H put B over mu zero. This is a constant. So it is equal one over mu zero D uh, next a curl of B dot. But now B dot is equal minus curl of E, yeah? So it is equal one over mu zero minus double curl of E. So just one small change, namely let us come back to, to D again. So instead of E, let us write D divided by E zero. So it is minus one over mu zero E zero. And now there is curl of curl of D. Now, what is this operator? We will, we will show it later, but now I will try to convince you that you should know that. It is minus Laplacian plus gradient of the divergence. I will 
prove it because it is relatively easy to prove. I will prove, but nowadays I don't want to to break this story. So this second term vanishes. Why? Because in vacuum the divergence of electric field is zero. Yeah. So what remains? is simply minus Laplacian. Here was minus, so finally we obtain my, uh, plus one, oh, so finally we obtain the following result. Unfortunately, this second table <laughs> So finally, we have d dot is equal 1 over mu 0 epsilon 0 Laplacian of d. And similarly, as I have already done it for you many times, we call this object c squared, therefore I define c equal square root of mu zero epsilon zero. So, yeah, yeah, here we will have oh no, 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 vice versa, excuse me. No, no, excuse me. It is other way around. It is d2 over d t square, and now it will be d, and this coefficient will be 1 over mu. Uh, no, it will be 1 over 1 over mu 0 epsilon 0, yeah, d is equal Laplacian of d, and again this quantity 1 over mu 0 epsilon 0 will be called c square, which means that this quantity will be called c, and this way we obtain, we have already been doing this many times. We see that d over d, not t, but c t, which is, yeah, so this can be called this new tau, is of d equal yeah. And this is nothing but, the, again, the wave equation. However, rem we remember that d is a vector. What does it mean? It means that each of components of d fulfills this scalar wave equation. Now, the ex home exercise for, for you. Do the same for, uh, for uh, B. Calculate B double dot and you will get the same result. Okay, so everything is not very exciting except the value which Maxwell obtained, because at that time it was around 1860, 62, 63, 1863 around. And people didn't know at that moment what is the light, light. For instance, you know that Newton has the had the idea of corpuscular uh, nature of light, that light there are small portions of light, particles, with, yeah? Of course, there are wave phenomena, so something is surely uh, vibrating, but what is vibrating? 
And then Maxwell noticed that this value is precisely equal to the velocity of light. Then it was for him the the proof that light is nothing but the vibrations of those electric uh, field, electromagnetic field. Because he obtained nowadays I hate this and I uh, like to uh, have one which means that I change the, uh, the um, units and because it, uh, it simplifies considerably the theory and so on. However, at his time, the discovery that this particular combination of those coefficients which were so much uh, with a great accuracy measured in the laboratory that this combination precisely corresponds to the, uh, the velocity of light was for Maxwell the proof that light is an electromagnetic wave. However, no other electromagnetic waves were known at that time. So, in a sense, you may say that he has invented electromagnetic waves, but then for almost 40 years, people were unable to, to, sh to show that we are able to, to uh, produce such waves. Okay, if it comes to us, the light, we agree that maybe his conjecture is good, it is electromagnetic, but are we able, we, to produce electromagnetic weight? And it took almost 40 years between this discovery, theoretical discovery, and the actual production and, uh, and uh, the measuring, because people around 1900 were able to, to, to measure electromagnetic waves, the radio and so on and so on. So it was very important. I believe that I will stop here. So please try this formula. I will prove because this is very easy. We shall also uh, re uh, rewrite Maxwell equations in a modern form and first of all uh, uh, next time I will discuss the contradiction between Maxwell Maxwell theory in in this formulation and the relativity which was later uh, yeah, and how Einstein improved this theory or removed this contradiction. Uh, still one. Ah, when the uh, gravitational waves were uh, were measured for the first time in 2015, you remember. 2015, then it also took a very long time between the theoretical discovery of those waves and experimental uh, measure. But I and people were very much exciting that only almost 100 years of the dis uh, after discovery of, uh, of gravitational waves, people were finally be, uh, were, uh, able to, to observe them. But in case of electromagnetic waves, the distance was not 100 years, but was 40, relatively long, very long 
time lapsed, yeah? So, uh, and please observe that this invention was done not because of some... Of course, there was a lot of, uh, of laboratory uh, experiments below this discovery, namely, uh, especially the, the Faraday discovery. But the, the final point was this science fiction uh, improvement of the Ampere law, which, um, which uh, Maxwell has done because of the beauty of the of, of the mathematics only, <laughs> without any experimental support. Yeah. Thank you very much.